encourage you for that. If you have a Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, I invite you to turn to the book of First Chronicles. It's in your Old Testament, First Chronicles chapter 16, and I really encourage you to have a Bible out. We're, uh, you know, our pastor does such a great job putting up slides with all the verses and all the references. And all. Uh, I have three kids. I don't have time for that. So you're really going to have to like look in your Bible to see uh, where all these things are coming from. So pull it up on your phone, pull it up on your lap, uh, get God's word out and get comfortable with it because we're going to go through it today, okay? <clears throat> Listen, in 1924, 1924, over 250,000 people gathered in Manhattan to watch department store employees march through the streets. Those employees were joined by aerial floats, musical performances, and even some live animals loaned out by the Central Park Zoo. From 1924 to today, 2023, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is the second longest running Thanksgiving Day Parade in American history. And whether the parade is on in the background or you and your family gather around the TV, many of you have made the parade part of your Thanksgiving Day tradition. While obviously the main goal of the parade is to entertain the masses, the parade also seeks to center Thanksgiving around cultural achievement. <clears throat> Here in First Chronicles, we get a very similar event. Like when you turn the TV on, if you've ever watched the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and you turn the TV on, you see all the people lining the streets and all the marching going on and all the singing going on. We have a very similar picture here in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Um, a Thanksgiving parade in which thousands of Israelites line the streets of Jerusalem. But unlike the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they were not seeking to center Thanksgiving around cultural achievement. They were there to center Thanksgiving around the one true living God. I have to give you a little bit of background before we jump into our text this morning. I think it's important. Um, in this period of time, King David is the king. Right before this, though, the first king of Israel, his name was King Saul. And King Saul started off probably with some good intentions, but it got sideways on him real quick. And we look back at him and we say he was an evil king. He departed from God. And as a result of him departing from God... Um, what happened was God removed the Ark of the Covenant from the people. Now, that's important because the Ark of the Covenant was a physical representation of the presence of God. So God moved his presence away from the people of Israel, from the king, Saul, and, and, it, and he moved away his blessing and he moved away his favor because Saul was not honoring God as God. So when David comes as king, he understands it's the, a man after God's own heart. I need to go get the ark, and I need to get it back into a place of prominence for the people of God. And so what David does is he builds this tent. It's called a tabernacle. He builds a tent, and it is going to be the home base for the ark of the covenant. And he sends people to go get the ark of the covenant and bring it back into the city of Jerusalem. And so as they get it and as they're bringing it back, people flock from all over Israel to the city of Jerusalem, and they line the streets. And even before the ark is there, they are lying in the streets singing praise to God. And then guess what? The ark enters into the city gates. And oh my goodness, you think the, the Macy's parade is something. The, the screams and the yells and the praise of all God's people as they watched the ark come down the streets. And then they watched it go into the tabernacle and be put down in the tabernacle. And the people came all around the tabernacle. And then you think that was a lot. Then it really hit its climax here in chapter 16. Chapter 16 opens up and it tells us in verse 1, so they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And so here it is. It's home. It's here in Jerusalem. God's people all around watching the event, praising God. And then verse 7 on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. So David wrote a psalm, and he gives it to the worship leader, and the worship leader gets the band, and he gets the choir, and he leads the people of God in this beautiful psalm that we are about to read. What I want you to get this morning is like the Israelites, 
we should seek to center our thanksgiving around the one true living God by praising him, making his name known, and honoring him. And we're going to see all those things here as we read the text. It's a long text, so I want you to bear with me. I, I, I really did think about, do I read the whole thing or do I not? We're going to read it because it's awesome, okay? So follow along with me, starting in verse 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Th seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders in the judgment of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance when you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. When they went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declo declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever and say save us O god our salvation gather us together and deliver us from the gentiles to give thanks to your holy name to triumph in your praise blessed be the lord god of israel from everlasting to everlasting and all the people said amen, amen. what a passage what a passage Man, let me encourage you every day this week to read that passage. Get fired up for the Lord. Get the, the wells of thanksgiving flowing in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. Read that and you will get a, a, a spiritual high like none other. In order for us to center our thanksgiving around God, we must first praise the Lord. We must first praise the Lord. You might think, okay, how? What does that look like? I, I hear praise the Lord all the time, but I kind of don't know how to do that. Like, what does it mean to praise the Lord? I'm glad you asked. The psalmist is glad you asked because the psalmist lays out for us eight things that you can do to praise the Lord. Look at verse 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. You know one way that you can praise the Lord is just be thankful, like give him thanks. You know, it's great, it's great to uh, go around the table. Hopefully you do this during your Thanksgiving tradition to go around the table and say, this is what I'm thankful for. That's great. Don't stop it. Continue that. Please do that. It's even better to give thanks to the Lord. Like it's, it's great to be thankful for your spouse and your kids and your car and your job, and that's good, and we should be thankful for all those things because all those things are good gifts from the Lord. But really, really, we should be thankful to the Lord who has provided us salvation in Jesus. 
we need to thank the Lord. Look at what it says next. It says, call upon his name. Call upon the Lord. One way that you can praise the Lord is just by calling upon his name. How do we do that? Well, the thing that popped into my mind right away was we pray. Hopefully, during your Thanksgiving meal, someone will lead in prayer. And hopefully, prayer will be an attitude as you walk through your Thanksgiving day, where it's not just one time you pray, but you're praying all throughout the day. Call upon his name. Right there in verse 8, it just keeps on going. Make known his deeds. You want to praise God? Well, make known what he is doing. What has God done for you? Has God done something for you? I would imagine so. So make them known. Tell other people what God has done for you. And so we see right here just in verse 8, three ways you and I can praise the Lord. But it continues, continues verse 9. Sing to him. Sing to the Lord. <clears throat> Listen, I get it. I get it. Many of you maybe say, Josh, you don't get it. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune. I don't know what melody is. I don't know what harmony is. I don't know what any of that means. Go look at Psalm 100. Psalm 100, 100 verse 1 says, make a joyful noise, okay? It doesn't say get the note right. It doesn't say get the melody right. It doesn't say find the harmony. It says a noise. Just make a noise. So many of us are so afraid to sing out because we don't have good voices Worship isn't about you, okay? It's not about the person in front of you, behind you, beside you. It's about God. Just make a joyful noise. Just do your best. Listen, no one at a football game is like yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs thinking, am I doing this right? No, they're just yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. They're just making a noise. The church should be way louder than the football field. We have so much more to be thankful for here in the house of God than the thousands of people gathered to watch some guy throw a football, okay? Um, we need to sing to him. We praise the Lord by singing, which is why we sing here at church, because we're attempting to praise the Lord. Look at verse 9. Talk of his works. Again, to go back with make known his deeds, talk about his works. Verse 10. Glory in his holy name. What in the world does that mean? You know, what does it mean to glory in the holy name of God? What does that, what does that mean? Well, glory, that word glory, it means to rejoice in or to boast in. To give you a picture of what this is really is, Jeremiah breaks this down for us pretty good in Jeremiah chapter 9. He says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows God, that I am, that God is the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in all the earth. When we talk about glorying uh, God, glory in his holy name, it's a, it's, it's a way that we're viewing the world. We're not putting ourselves in the driver's seat. We're putting God in the driver's seat. We're boasting not in our accomplishments, not in what we have, not in all the things that are going on in our life. We're boasting in the Lord. It's really taking the back seat and putting God in his rightful seat. That's what it means to glory in his holy name. Look at verse 11. Seek the Lord. Seek him. Uh, like, go after it. You know, many of you who are married, you remember what it was like to pursue your spouse? Men, do you remember what it was like to pursue your wife? You remember that? You, like, sought after her. You, like, found her. You semi-stalked her, right? And you got the phone number, and then you, you, you called her, and you got all everything working, right? Um, seek the Lord just like that. Just go after it. Go after God. Find out who he is. And I love this verse 12. Remember his marvelous works. Remember. Remember. Listen, we're, it's so easy for us to get caught on the negative stuff. Uh, you know, in life, I don't have enough money. This, uh, my kids are acting like, like hoodlums. You know, uh, it's so easy to get hooked on the negative. S just remember, take a, step, take a breath to remember all the things that God has done for you. You want to praise the Lord this Thanksgiving? You want to center your Thanksgiving around God? Do these things. Praise the Lord. But this is really great because... You might say, well, well, why should I do that? Like, why should I praise the Lord? And, and we, we get an answer. Look at verse 15 here. David says, remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. You guys remember this? Our pastor just preached on this, so hopefully you remember this. But God made a promise with Abraham. And God made this promise with Abraham. He says, Abraham, because of your faith, I'm going to make you uh, a nation. There's going to be, you're going to have descendants that, that are more than the sand and the, 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 the ocean, more than the stars and the heavens, uh, and, and, and you're going to have a land all to your own, a people all to your own. 
right? And then you remember what happened, right? They were in the land of Canaan, but they got sucked out of the land of Canaan because of famine, and they had to live in, in Egypt for a little bit, and then they became slaves, and that's not fun, right? But then God raised up a deliverer in Moses, and Moses took the people out of Egypt, and he took them back to Canaan, and, and then Joshua took them into Canaan, and he conquered the land, and guess what? They set up the nation of Israel, and then they had kings, and David is saying, look, look around. Look at what God has done. God took us from just a small amount of people, just Jacob's family, and look at who we are now. Look at what God has done for us. Why should you praise the Lord? Because he is a covenant-keeping God. He is the God who keeps his promises. And you say, okay, Joshua, cool. God kept his promise with Abraham. What does that mean for, you, for me? Well, guess what? God promises you something, too. God promises you salvation through Jesus. And guess what? He's going to keep that promise. He's going to keep that promise. You don't have to worry about if God's going to keep that, that side of the, the deal or not. And I love this. Our pastor mentioned this uh, when he's talking about the land. He said that God kept both sides of the covenant. He kept his side and he kept Abraham's side because Abraham was unfaithful to keep it himself. We have a God who's willing to hold up not only his end of the bargain, but our end of the bargain too. It's, am it's amazing. This is why we praise the Lord. This is why hopefully this week you are praising the Lord because he is a covenant-keeping God. <clears throat> so first thing, first thing for us to center our, our thanksgiving around God, we have to praise the Lord. I want you to see a second thing here is the second thing is we need to make known his name. If you want to center your thanksgiving around God, you're going to have to make known his name. Well, how do I do that? How do I make known his name? Look at verse 23. Here it is again. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. You want to make known the name of God? Sing to the Lord. Now, probably none of you are going to, like, start singing on Thursday just randomly, right? Uh, so uh, I want to propose something maybe a little bit different for, uh, for us in this uh, century, something that, something that the people of God didn't have at this time, in the, in the time of First Chronicles. You and I have recorded music, don't we? You and I have, and, and, and don't, isn't music powerful? Do you guys understand, like, the power that music has on our lives? Have you ever been, like, somewhere and you hear a song and it takes you vividly back to a memory in your life like that's that's pretty powerful <laughs> pretty powerful that a song can trigger something in your brain and take you back vividly to something 40 50 60 years ago that's that's wild okay that's wild so I'll just share my quick story is uh, in the early 90s uh, my family lived in Orlando and uh, my parents always had Christian music that well, I was not allowed to listen to anything else nothing else just Christian music and um, uh, my parents favorite artist was Stephen Curtis Chapman I don't know if you ever heard of this guy he's pretty awesome and so he was on all the time and and there's songs from Stephen Curtis Chapman that when they come on or when they come shuffled through my mixes and stuff, I can go back to being eight years old in my living room watching my mom fold the laundry, and I can see everything in our house just from a song. It's wild. And, and so I want to encourage you this Thanksgiving. Music has power. Put it in your home. Like, put the truths of God in song in your home. Uh, Carol and I talk about this all the time. Carol's like, if you ever have any problem sleeping, just turn on Christian music and God will take care of the rest for you. And guess what? She's not wrong. She's not wrong. Listen, I get it. We love all the other. We love the hip hop. We love the pop. We love the country. I'm sure a lot of country fans in the room right now. Throw all of it away. It's all worthless and meaningless. Put on something that actually matters. A lot of my theology is informed from music that I listened to as a little kid uh, all the way up to now. So this Thanksgiving, uh, no matter who's in your home, turn that Christian music on. Have it piping through the house a little bit. Have people hearing the word of God without even knowing that they're hearing the word of God. Yeah. All right? Uh, so sing to the Lord. That's how we make known his name. And that's why we sing to each other here. Like when, Listen, I want you to understand something. When we sing here, we're singing to God primarily, but we're also singing to each other. All right? Uh, when, when, the, when we're up here, the praise team is up here doing our thing, we're not here to perform for you, okay? That's, that is not, listen, we are not that great, okay? We're not bad. We're not bad, okay? We're just not that awesome, okay? We're not here to entertain you, okay? We're here to sing with you and to you, and you're to sing to us. 
to encourage us. These, the words matter. And when I hear you sing back to me these words, that's encouraging. So that's why we sing here. I spent too long on that. Let's keep it on here. All right? Make known his name. Make known his name. Look at verse 23. It continues. Proclaim his salvation. Proclaim his salvation. Now, I will tell you, here in the context of First Chronicles, David is talking about physical enemies around the nation of Israel that wanted to stamp out Israel. Yes, people wanted to stamp them out then, just as they do now. It's been a thing their whole, their whole life, okay? Um, but with our New Testament lenses on, what does this mean for us? This means our salvation in Jesus. Sure, God is going to protect you from, from your enemies as well, but, man, to putting on those New Testament lenses to seeing that God saved me from my sin, and so I am to proclaim his salvation. Listen, if you're a Christian, you have a, you have a story. We call that story a testimony, a personal testimony. Let me ask you something. Do, you, do your kids know how you came to know Jesus? Do your grandkids know how you come to know Jesus? And you say, oh, yeah, I've told them once. Once is not enough. Once is not enough. Listen, I've, I've done funerals before. And you ask, and you're like, hey, how did your, you know, how did your dad come to know Jesus? And like, oh, uh, he went to church. And it's like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> like, you don't even know. You don't, like, your dad never told you how he came to know Jesus? And I don't tell them that, obviously. That'd be, that'd be very rude, right? Um, but just in my heart, like, it breaks my heart. It's like, when I leave this earth, I want my kids to be able to repeat it word for word, like word for word, and know that when they die, they're going to see me again in heaven because that's where I'm going, right? So tell your story. The personal testimony has three aspects, your life before Christ, how you met Christ, and what your life has been like after Christ. It doesn't have to be a radical story. It doesn't have to be like, I was a druggie, and I was tattooed up, and I had earrings in all these places, and then Jesus saved me, and now I'm, now I'm living for him. No, it, it just, you know, I stole change out of my mom's purse, knew I was a sinner, and I came to know Jesus. And, you know, it doesn't have to be some awesome story. It could be just boring, and that's fine because the story is that Jesus saved you, and that's never boring proclaim his salvation. I wonder if this Thanksgiving you would gather your kids around and just tell them, hey, this is when I came to know Jesus, and this is why I'm thankful to God for what he has done for me. Look at verse 24. Declare his glory and wonder. Again, that word glory, it just hangs me up. Like, what, is, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Because this is a completely different word even. This isn't even the same word as we just read uh, a couple verses before. So what is he talking about here? When we talk about God's glory, we're talking about three, typically we're talking about three things. We're talking about what he does, his actions in the world. We're talking about his character or his reputation. Uh, or we're talking about the beauty of his very being. We're talking about, we're declaring God's actions, his character, and just how awesome he is. You know, uh, uh, we need to be telling people about how awesome God is to us. And you might say, well, why? Why should we make known uh, the name of God? Well, look at verse 25. Uh, it says, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. And check this out. He is also to be feared above all gods. Verse 26, for the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You know what the main idea there is? We should make known the name of God because he is the one true living God. Any other God is just an idol. Any other God is meaningless. Any other God isn't really a thing. Like It's just a deception. You and I, we know the one true living God, and we know things about him. Look at 24, look at back at 25. He is great. Um, he is preeminent. He's above the other gods. He is first. Look at uh, verse 26. He is the creator. Verse 27, he is majestic. He is strong. And we can all testify to this, right? Listen, every human being was made for worship. And every human being was created with a God-shaped void in our spirit. And, and we try to fill it with all kinds of different things uh, without even knowing it. We're not, like, we don't acknowledge that we have this void, and we're not trying to fill it. That's just what we do. That's just part of life. We're just trying to fill this emptiness that's in us. And, and everything that we put in there that's not God, maybe it'll provide some temporary satisfaction, but it won't provide lasting satisfaction. 
When we make known the name of God, we provide people with the one thing that can fill that void and give them eternal satisfaction. You say, you know, I just don't, I don't want to tell people because I don't want to like, I don't want to impede. Maybe they don't believe in the same things. Maybe they've heard it before or, or maybe they'll ask me a question and I don't know how to answer it. And, and who, throw all that aside without, they might not verbalize this to you and they may like spit in your face, tell you to get away from them. But deep down in the root of their being, they are looking for the answer that you have. You have the answer that they are seeking even if they don't want to admit it or not. So you tell them because they need it. They need Jesus. They need the Lord. And so we need to spend this Thanksgiving making known the name of God. So to center Thanksgiving around God, we praise the Lord. We make known his name. But lastly, we honor the Lord. We honor the Lord. Look, at, uh, <clears throat> look here in verse 28. If you look at verse 28 and 29, you'll see a phrase that's repeated, repeated three times. Give to the Lord, O families. Give to the Lord, glory. Give to the Lord, the glory. Give to the Lord. Like this phrase, give to the Lord. <clears throat> we don't really have anything to give to the God, okay? God doesn't really need anything from us, okay? Uh, praise God. Uh, uh, a better translation for that word give is the word ascribe. Now, again, that's not really a word that we go around using a whole bunch either. So I was like, okay, well, that's not helpful. Uh, but that word ascribe means to give credit to or to honor. Give credit. And so what he's saying is give credit to the Lord. Give credit to the Lord. How do we give credit to God for all that he does? How do we honor God? Well, look at what it says uh, here in verse 29. It says to bring a sacrifice. Now, thankfully, for your sake and for my sake, the sacrificial system no longer exists. We didn't have to come in here with our lambs uh, this morning and get messy together, okay? We didn't have to do that. Praise God. We had the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a relationship with Jesus. Praise God. So, okay, if I can't sacrifice a lamb, what am I sacrificing here exactly? Well, Paul gives us a great answer in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You are the sacrifice. Let me tell you something. Christianity works like this. Christianity is not like a one-stop fix-it. Like, it's not, I'm going to go down there, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm in heaven, and then I can go do whatever I want to do. That's not Christianity. If someone told you that's what Christianity is, they lied to you, okay? Christianity is a day-to-day -day surrendering of your will, surrendering of the things that you want, your desires, for God's desires. That's Christianity. Christianity is a day-to-day -day thing. Now, yes, we all fall short. Me too, okay? Me too. All right, so I'm not trying to beat you up here. But the goal should be a day-to-day -day sacrifice of what I want for what God wants. Um, that's Christian. That's true Christianity. And that's what we see here. We bring an offering, and the offering is you. Verse 29, how do we honor God? How do we honor the Lord? We worship him. And, and I, love, I love what he says here. He says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So this is not a, talking about worshiping God because of what he has done for you. This is talking about worshiping God because of who he is. Like if God did nothing from you, if tomorrow God emptied your bank account, gave you cancer, and, and just your life was in, in shambles, he'd still be worthy of your worship because of who he is. It's not dependent upon what he does for you. This worship is just dependent upon who he is, the beauty of his holiness. You are to worship God not merely because of what he does for you, but because of who he is. Because I'm telling you right now, if you live long enough, you're going to have mountaintops, and guess what else you're going to have? You're going to have valleys. You're going to have times when you have it all, and everything in life is going great, and you're going to have times where everything is not going great. And guess what? God is going to be worthy of your worship on the mountaintop and in the valley. And so we need to honor the Lord by worshiping him. Look at verse 30. Tremble before him. Love this word, tremble, because this is not modern Christianity. 
We're like, God loves me. God affirms me. God approves of everything that I do. Wrong. Wrong. That's wrong. It's wrong. Yes, God loves you. That part is true. But he does not affirm everything that you do. He does not approve of everything that you do. And you should work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Because this is a God who tomorrow could end your life. Tomorrow. And you say, well, what, what gives you the, the, the right to say that? Uh, the Bible. Uh, a couple chapters before this in First Chronicles 16. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant has been away for a while. So the people have forgotten how to handle it. There were rules. There were do's and don'ts. God made it very clear you don't do certain things when you're handling the Ark of the Covenant. One of those rules was don't touch it ever, 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 ever. To move it, they'd put rods in the side of it, and they could touch the rods, and they'd carry it with, with rods. But don't you ever lay one finger on the Ark. They would forgot about this, and they put it on a cart, and they were trying to get it back to Jerusalem. And, you know, they didn't have paved roads back then, so the cart was doing this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you ever been that? You been in the woods doing this? And that Ark was looking like it's going to fall off. So one of the people of Israel, you know what they did? Great intentions. Put his hand on it to push it back on there. You know what happened to him? He died instantly, on the spot, dead. Why? Because he touched the ark and he wasn't supposed to. Listen, I get it. We want to talk about the Jesus who died on the cross for your sins, and we, that's great. We should. This is also a God who will end your life tomorrow. Y- you want to you come up against God and say, I'm going to do it my way? Okay, good luck. Numbers chapter 16, there was about 250 people in the time of Moses who said, we're going to go up against Moses and go up against God. All of them died. God literally opened up the earth and all their families, the people that were just related to them, they weren't even in the insurrection. They were just related to the insurrectionists. God opened up the earth and they all died. And then the people who went to like face off, like face to face with Moses, God burned them alive. That's number 16. You can go read it. It's crazy. He said, okay, Josh, all right. That's just the Old Testament. <laughs> Let's fast forward to Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 5, shall we? There was this uh, couple, Ananias, Sapphira. <clears throat> they told a lie about how much they were tithing to the church. They died on the spot. This is not a God to trifle with, folks. It's not a God to look at and say, I'm going to go my way. You just do your thing. Because tomorrow, he could end your life. And so we need to approach God. We need to honor God. We need to fear this God in power and might who could end your life tomorrow. All right? And that's not to make you feel bad. That's supposed to make you feel joyful that the God whom you serve says, hey, follow me, not yourself, because you're going to mess it up. And I got you. I'm going to provide, I'm going to bless, I'm going to show you great favor if you would just follow me. God wants the best for you. He doesn't want to judge you. He doesn't want to open the earth and swallow you. He wants you to live for him all the days of, his, of your life, right? But don't push him. Don't push the Lord. Instead, honor him. Why? Look at verse 32. This is great. <clears throat> verse 32. Let the sea roar. Let the field rejoice. Let the trees of the woods rejoice. You know why we honor God? Because all of creation honors God. Every blade of grass exists to honor God. Every cell in an animal's body exists to honor God. And guess what? If the blade of grass is here to honor God and it doesn't do anything but grow (laughs) and then die, shouldn't we honor God? Yep, yep, we should probably honor God. We should probably honor God, right? Listen, I want you to, uh, I want you to see how this ends, though. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is great right here. Uh, it, ends, it ends with verse um, 34. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. I love this little tag. They add a little tag here. They said, save us, O God, of our salvation, gathers together and delivers from the Gentiles. Why? Why? So that we can continue to give thanks and praise and worship to you. Save us so that we can continue to worship you. <laughs> Listen, this is awesome, right? We thank God because he is great and he is full of mercy. You're here today because of the mercy of God. 
and that should cause you to be thankful. And we should say, God, save us, sanctify us. Now, again, again, here he's talking about their literal enemies. He names them, the Gentiles. Save us from the Gentiles. You and I, uh, in the process of salvation called sanctification, where every day we're living out our faith, we need God to save us every day. God, get involved in my life every day. Let me help me to surrender to you every day. So why? Why? Why should I want God to save me every day? So that I can continue on in thanksgiving and praise and worship. Listen, there's a lot of things that you've got going on in your life. You've got jobs. You've got families. You've got kids. You've got all these things. There's one thing that should be at the top of that list, and that is to praise God with your life. And so many times in my life, all the fingers pointing at me, okay, uh, in my life and in your life, that gets moved down the list. Don't let it get moved down the list. Fight today to move that back to the top of the list to praise God with everything that you are. Um, in closing, there's something really interesting here about the book of Chronicles. In your Bible, you have First and Second Chronicles. It was written as one big piece uh, uh, of literature. And it was written as a retelling of the history of the people of God. Now, you'll remember this is um, after David, there comes Solomon, and then after Solomon comes other kings, and then eventually Israel has civil war. And, uh, and it actually separates. They, they turn into two territories. The north retains the name of Israel. The south uh, takes on the name of Judah. And they both have their own kings. There's a king in the north. There's a king in the south. And the vast majority of all those kings are evil. And God says, listen, if you don't turn, I'm going to judge you. And, and when the people repented, guess what God did? He relented. But, it, again, God's not going to be messed with but only so much. And at some point, God wiped Israel off the face of the map. And all the people that remained, he took them into captivity. And they were in captivity for 70 years. 70 years. No, no big things going on in Israel for 70 years. Finally, they start to return to Israel after 70 years. Nehemiah goes back, and he rebuilds the walls. Zerubbabel goes back, and he rebuilds the ta tabernacle. But it's all plain. It's not like it was in the time of King David. It's not like it was in the king time of King Solomon. They're weak. They don't even have their own king. They have a Persian governor that watches over them. And they, they're, they're looking around at their circumstances, and they're saying, can God ever restore? Can God ever redeem? Now, we don't know for, for a fact who wrote Chronicles. But most scholars believe it was a guy named Ezra. So we're going to go with that, okay? Uh, Ezra pens this history to remind the people who God is and what he has done for them over and over and over again. And I want to tell you this. Wh why do I bring that up? It's because so many times in life, you and me, we look around at our circumstances, and it's tough to be thankful. And our pastor said it last, this last week. Our job is to ignore our circumstances and look up to a God who is able to redeem and to restore and to put your life back together and to make you whole again. So this Thanksgiving, I don't know where you're at. I don't know whether, whether you're on the top of the world or you're at the bottom. Or most of us are probably somewhere in between, right? Don't spend your Thanksgiving looking around at your circumstances. Instead, Look to the God of your circumstances, the one who doesn't change, the one true living God.